thanks for the invitation. It's really good to be back in Ann Arbor. Lots of construction going on. Challenging things on North Campus. Um, so yeah, what I'm going to tell you about today is a, a lot of this work, it, it goes back to my PhD time in, in Dan Ferris's lab, uh, who many of you have probably heard of or maybe even know personally. Um, and we've tried to extend that work, kind of take a more, uh, look more on the human side of the human robot interface and try to get insights from how the human biology interacts with the device in order to make devices better. Um, so I'm going to start out with like a clinical example here and maybe that pneumatic exoskeleton looks familiar to some of you. It, it was developed here at University of Michigan by myself and a number of other colleagues including Keith Gordon and is still in use down here um, in the Department of Kinesiology. We're applying it to try to help people uh, move better following a stroke. So it's a little bit of a different application and that means the controller has to change a little bit so I'll tell you some about that. Problem with that device is you can't leave the lab with it because it's tethered to a um, pneumatic system that requires you to plug into the wall and a lot of electricity. And so we've also been working on ways to make portable devices that can have similar action uh, during gait outside the laboratory. And so in the second part of the talk, I'll tell you about um, some recent work with another UM, U of M alum, Steve Collins, who's now, now at Carnegie Mellon to build this portable spring-loaded device that can reduce the energy cost during walking. Okay, so the, the overall goal of my lab is to, is to think about humans as a machine that utilizes gas, except the gas is oxygen and ATP, right? It's biological fuel. And what we're really trying to do is improve the gas mileage of people, um, whether they have some impairment or they're already healthy and we're trying to make them, we're trying to augment their performance. And our approach to this, um, I think is a little bit unique, but, but maybe not so much anymore. I think the field's kind of coming around to the idea that we need to understand human physiology during locomotion better to build these devices better. Here's an array of devices that you may or may not be familiar with. These are sort of the bulky, um, in my opinion, overpowered devices that um, are now headed to market to do things like help people with a spinal cord injury uh, take a few steps with, with the help of uh, maybe some crutches. Um, the device in the middle there, HAL, is, is interesting. It uses uh, proportional myoelectric control, so it reads the user's intent and then enhances uh, movement by providing torques around the joints over the whole body. And on the left there is um, the Exobionics um, device, which started out as a, a DARPA and DOD project to try to help soldiers carry load. Um, and I, my contention is that these devices are overpowered, they're bulky, they're certainly expensive. Um, insurance isn't paying for these yet. And most of them increase effort. So they're not doing anything to improve gas mileage, they're actually making it worse. And we only recently found that out because people started making physiological measurements while people walked in them. That didn't happen for a long time, surprisingly. So our idea is to extend that approach and step back and just try to understand a little bit about how humans move in the first place and take some of the best ideas that humans show us when they move and try to incorporate those into devices. So I'm just going to tell you, we, ha we have a basic uh, locomotion laboratory set up. Uh, there's an instrumented treadmill. We use motion capture. We can see when muscles are on and off using electromyography. Calorimetry to get gas mileage measurements and then one thing unique to our lab is ultrasound imaging. We, we, we can actually look at what muscles are doing, um, calf muscles only at this point because the hardware is not good enough to move proximally. We don't have big enough viewfinders to see large muscles in the proximal limb. But what we can do is we can look at how the calf and Achilles tendon interact during walking and running to try to understand what, what the muscles are actually doing when they function. So here's a couple forays into the basic science. This is Dominic Ferris. He's now in Australia. He's a research scientist um, over there. And he was a postdoc in our lab when we first started out about six years ago. And um, we wanted to ask pretty simple fundamental questions like, how do humans distribute power out amongst the joints of their lower limb? Why might you care if you have a certain amount of resources to build an exoskeleton and you can put it on one joint? Which one should you put it on? And we thought about this as creating a road map for where power absorption and generation is happening and using that as a way to guide where we put things. 
But we needed to first figure out where, uh, where work's happening, where power input of the muscles is, is um, manifesting in the limb. So we did some inverse dynamics. Basically, you record people while they walk on an instrumented treadmill. You measure the ground forces. At the same time, you measure um, how their rigid, rigid body assumption, how their limbs are moving. And then you do basic uh, newton Euler mechanics to estimate what the torques and power outputs are at the joints. And when you do that, you can add up all the, uh, the energy generated in the generation phase of gait. Um, and then see how that's distributed across the hip, which I'll show you in white, and then the knee in gray, and, and the ankle joint will be in black. These will be presented as pie charts. And what these pie charts represent are the sizes, how much total energy is coming out of the joint um, during walking on the top left at really slow speed up to fast walking. This is around the walk-run transition. You can see the pie charts get bigger. The gates become more energy intensive. There's an equal amount of negative and positive work happening, but we use the positive work as an indicator of uh, how fuel, how mechanical energy might be being generated. And then if you come back down here to the bottom, this is running at the same speed as walking here, and then running up through like a medium pace jog. And what you can see is that um, the predominant source of energy is the ankle joint across speed and gait, I would argue, with the hip coming in a close second and sometimes the hip actually takes over um, for more intense tasks. But the knee is not doing much in terms of generation. And so what does that mean? If we've, if we've got a certain amount to invest in building an exoskeleton for the lower limb, we would like to put it on the ankle joint because the idea is that we want to replace some of the, uh, the energy input that muscles have to do to produce that positive work. And we think we can get the most bang for the buck by focusing on ankle. Another thing to note is that we, we also measured uh, energy consumption in those same gates. And what you can see is that um, in the walk-run transition here, this graph is efficiency of positive work. The top graph is cost of transport. They're almost inverse relationship to each other. What you can see is that at the walk-run run transition, your cost of transport goes up, uh, but the efficiency that is, the, the amount of metabolic energy you use for a given unit uh, mechanical work actually improves when you switch to a running gait. And lo and behold, you're also uh, predominantly switching back to an ankle strategy there. So this is also evidence that not only do we rely on ankle uh, to generate power, but that power is likely very efficient. Another reason to potentially have a look at using, ma making ankle joint the focal point for assistance, or so we thought. So the next step is we've got a little basic science in our back pocket to motivate the idea to use an ankle exoskeleton. This slide's really old. It's from my PhD dissertation. I think I still have it in my talks. Um, and we still use a very similar platform. So the device we're using is, is a carbon fiber boot with a hinge um, and a foot section that can fit inside a shoe. And then there's a, a pneumatic actuator. These are sometimes called McKibben actuators. You pump them full of pressurized air, and they change shape and shorten and produce force a lot like skeletal muscle. Um, they have a length tension an active length tension relationship that's very similar to skeletal muscle. Uh, they also react in terms of time to peak tension, like the electromechanical delay and time to peak tension characteristics are very similar to skeletal muscle. So what's cool is you can steal the person's intent by recording their EMG from the muscle that you want to enhance. And then uh, in parallel, route that to the device. That same signal is going to their real muscle, and it's going to the pneumatic muscle. And now you have systems working in parallel, hopefully one helping out the other. Now, let's say, all right, we've got a, we think we have a device that works pretty well. And my dissertation study showed that you could, you could get reductions in gas mileage with respect to the added mass of that device. So that means I've got to, I've got to uh, spend extra ATP, oxygen, whatever your currency is, to walk around because I have now added mass on my legs. But when I turn the pneumatic assistance on, I can reduce the activity required of the calf muscles in such a way that I get basically 10% below that added mass cost. Problem is, this, that device was bulky. We couldn't actually get a net, in, a net improvement in gas mileage because all we could do was cancel the, the mass of the device, which at that time was actually uh, the best demonstration of 
getting close to breaking what we call the nor normal barrier. Just canceling the device itself, right? So not, not, that, not that impressive. So that's with normal subjects, people who don't have an impairment. So you might say, okay, well, what, why not just take this and do other things with it? Take someone who's, not, who's underperforming, try to bring their performance back to some normal level. Then maybe you don't really care that much about metabolic cost. You just want, want them to get to take symmetric steps and move in the world. So that's what we started thinking about when I started my own lab. We wanted to take this device and apply it to clinical populations where uh, we thought we'd have a better chance of, of actually making an impact. And so we went back to the basic science drawing board again to try to understand um, how is post-stroke gait different than normal gait. And Dominic and Austin, Austin uh, now works at the VA system in, um, in Mississippi. Dominic, I mentioned, is in Australia. Austin got his master's degree in the lab. They teamed up. Um, to do some of the basic science. And then Kota Takahashi, who was a postdoc who just left the lab and is now at University of Nebraska at Omaha, he sort of uh, did the exoskeleton and intervention studies uh, after the basic science. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about these two questions. How do the mechanics and energetics change post-stroke? And then can we put that pneumatically controlled, proportional myoelectric, proportional myoelectric controlled device on a person with stroke on their weaker limb and improve their symmetry and, and gas mileage. So back to the human locomotion experiments again. Uh, we use this whole kit to try to understand what's happening post-stroke. And what we did is we compared um, neurologically intact healthy controls with post-strokes with stroke survivors walking at a, at a match speed which was a slow speed, 0.75 meters per second. And uh, we looked at the mechanics in a couple different ways. First, we did what's called an individual limbs analysis of the gait, which was developed by uh, Max Donnellan and Art Kuo, who's part of mechanical engineering here. And the idea is that um, if you use the split belt treadmill to record forces under each limb individually, you can understand how people move from one pendular motion to another um, and, and that happens to be where a lot of the energy is spent during gait. And so it's important to know what each limb is doing during the double support period. So what you see here is a graph on the top, individual limb power output. So this is basically um, the contribution to the center of mass um, from each limb in terms of the power that's moving the body through the world. And the curve on the left is a solid line on the top left there. This is con healthy control data can see a burst of positive power. This is the time when the person has both legs on the ground, and that solid black line is the trailing limb giving a push so that the body can enter a pendular support phase. Um, at the same time, this curve down here is the braking power or the absorption that's happening simultaneously by the leading leg. So you have a collision, energy is absorbed, simultaneously energy is generated. That redirects the center of mass. That's what this is showing right here. You've got to get from one pendulum to another. Work is required. And this simultaneously, uh, simultaneous work by leading and trailing limb is a, a really efficient way to do this, theory, theory and experiments both say. Now you can see, so this is the first part of the gate up to about halfway. So again, I have a trailing limb. It's giving a push. That's the solid curve early. The leading limbs giving a braking is absorbing energy. That's the dash curve early. And then, of course, those switch so that now the trailing leg was the leading leg. And that's why the dotted curve now appears to be generating energy. This is a whole gait cycle. And it looks really symmetric because this person doesn't have a neurological impairment. Um, so they're, they're doing basically the same thing with their leading and trailing limbs, and then they just switch. Um, if you look at what happens uh, to a following a stroke. So in this case, the trailing limb is what we call the non-paretic, the limb that doesn't have spasticity. It's the stronger limb. Okay, that's the dark curve early on this plot. Um, the leading limb here is the paretic limb, and there there's a weakness. So you still have a collision that looks reasonably healthy when the, le when the leading limb is, is, uh, is the paretic limb. The trailing limb ha also has no problem producing power output similar to what you see in a healthy control. But when things go wrong is when that 
when the roles are switched and the paretic limb becomes trailing, you can see there's a huge deficit now in the ability of the person's limb to push off. Also, the timing gets very skewed here. Uh, there's not very good overlap of simultaneous positive and negative work, and that has consequences up the chain. I'll show you some joint level data. But just from the individual limbs, we can see here that uh, the person's not propelling themselves through the world in the most efficient way. And again, the idea is maybe we can intervene with an exoskeleton working locally at one of the joints. We pick the ankle um, in order to restore symmetry to the gait and hopefully improve the gas mileage of the person. Here are some, um, some data from inverse dynamics. These are moments. So these are uh, for each of the joints going from top to bottom. You have ankle, knee, and hip. I don't want to belabor the, the plots too much, but the healthy control data is in gray, paretic limb in solid, and non-paretic in dashed. Remember, the paretic limb is the one with the weakness. And you can see here that paretic is, doing, is producing less moments at the ankle at push-off than control. Non-paretic doing pretty, things that are pretty similar um, in terms of moment generation. And then what I really want you to focus on is this compensation that happens at the hip. So the non-paretic hip is making up for uh, lack of impulse at the ankle. And this, this is kind of a common thing that threads through the literature if you read up. Um, there seems to be something fundamental about an ankle-hip trade-off that we don't fully understand. But many people will, many populations, including amputees, will power their gait using hip torques when they can't push off well. And so that's also very costly because the hip muscles don't have very, very good elastic energy storage and return capability. Um, not a lot of storage happening and cycling to, to offload muscles. So if, you have to do, if you're forced to do things with your hip because you can't push off well with your ankles, gas mileage really suffers. And again, we think with a local intervention at the ankle, we might be able to, um, to fix that issue. So the data on the left is power output data. It basically tells the same story. If you break down the power of the limb across the joints, you see this trade-off, lack of uh, energy generation at the ankle and compensations at the hip that are making up for it. And that's kind of summarized in the pie chart. So on the left, the pie chart circled in red is the total left plus right limb or paretic plus non-paretic for, for the stroke survivor cohort. So you can notice a few things right away, and on the right is control. There's differences in both the distribution of where work is done and also the amount. So uh, stroke survivors use a lot more mechanical energy to move at the same speed. Remember, this is speed matched. So we, we forced controls to walk slower than they would prefer, uh, but we wanted to have an apples to apples comparison. Um, so they do more total work, and the way in which they do it is asymmetric. What's kind of interesting is for this cohort, um, the paretic limb was not that different than control. So we're not pushing the limits. If we went to faster speeds, we might start to see the paretic limb reduce with respect to control subjects, I would think. Um, but the other thing to notice, again, is this hip-ankle trade-off. So in controls, the black piece of pie, 43% ankle, significantly lower post-stroke, 36%. And then you can see also that that's made up for by the white piece of pie. And it's on both legs. Paretic and non-paretic both do more with their hips. And if you measure metabolic cost by oxygen, CO2 consumption at the mouth, stroke subjects spend 50% you know, more metabolic energy. Turns out, this is another interesting point, that the increase in metabolic energy scales exactly with the mechanical work. So the efficiency of the gait is not different between um, stroke survivors and healthy controls. They're just doing more work because they have to um, compensate for asymmetry, we think. Okay, so we, uh, we, we go back to the device. Let me step back. Except this time we made it a lot more streamlined. So we spent a little bit of time designing better carbon fiber structures um, with a lot less metal on them that are a little bit more form-fitting. We did things like add a truss system 
um, as an underskeleton to the device to eliminate metal and so forth, a little bit of finite element modeling. Um, but the actuator is still the same and the, the approach is still the same. We're stealing signal from the stroke survivor's uh, ankle plantar flexor, the main plantar flexor, the soleus muscle, feeding that as a feed forward signal to the device. I always have to play this when I'm in the Midwest. This is uh, Keith Gordon, who's my academic brother. That's th these are his legs. So this is also a very old video. But this just demonstrates that basically things are happening in real time. And like I mentioned before, the delays, when you sum the delays electromechanical and time to peak tension, you get similar response um, to skeletal muscle. So we did have to make one small tweak when we apply this to stroke survivors. So as you might imagine, um, there's sometimes the EMG signal that's there for the taking is not, is not appropriate in terms of its timing or amplitude. So you could, you could take an approach where you try to shape that. Um, you take the signal and then, you know, I don't know, truncate it and, and gain it up to be something that you like. Or in our case, what we did is we used a mechanical gating approach. So now instead of only recording from the soleus, we continue to do that. We want the person's own volition intent to come through to the device. We want them to have control over it. But we're also monitoring their posture, a proxy of their posture, whether or not they're actually pushing themselves forward or not through the ground reaction forces. These are the four after forward backward ground reaction forces. Negative is when that limb is pushing backwards or the world is pushing backwards through the limb on the person. And positive over here is when that limb is uh, doing net propulsion. And so we had the rule that uh, the person has to be in a position where they're propelling their body in order for the proportional myoelectric control signal to bleed through and give them assistance. And this is, um, I don't know, our intuition was that we wanted them not only to work on the timing and amplitude of their, ac of their muscle activity, but also the positioning of their limb in order to get mechanical assistance that's useful. So that's what we did. Um, we recruited five stroke survivors just to do a feasibility study. And so far, that's where we're at. I'll show you some data. Here's a video. So hopefully you can see that when you start hearing the ch 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 uh, the amplitude of the steps, the step length on the predic side definitely gets longer. They're using a little bit, they're, they're able to incorporate the extra energy from the exoskeleton to start to improve the symmetry of their gait, which is, this, this is what we want to happen. Um, when we looked closer at the data, at the, data the results are, uh, are promising, but I think there's still a lot of ways to go, so I just want to hopefully give you guys some take-homes as we go through the data and maybe inspire some future research in this group since you guys have the tools and the subject population locally it would be cool to see other groups working on similar things so again there's the controller we're taking EMG and ground reaction forces and you can see that data on the top so on the top left this is them walking but the device is not powered on so we're acquiring data and uh, but we're not actually the device is not powered up so we're not going to see any artificial muscle control or muscle force signal yet. It's just quiet. Um, and what we're plotting down here is in red will be the exoskeleton's contribution to the black, which is the total power output coming from the ankle, exo plus person, right? Biological plus exoskeleton. Um, so here you can see that there's a huge burst of EMG during the breaking phase coming from soleus in this subject which is a quite common occurrence post-stroke. That timing is not what you would see in a healthy control. It would be much later, um, and it would be more intense in the propulsion phase. So you can already see we're dealing with a challenging signal processing problem here um, that we're hoping that that ground reaction force gating is going to help with. So here's what happened when we powered it on. We still have that early burst, but what's really cool is after 15 minutes, 
they're learning that if they, if they place a burst during the propulsion phase, they're going to get some help from the exoskeleton. This was our star performer, by the way. We didn't really see this uh, average behavior over the five subjects as, as clearly as we'd like to. But it's promising that some individuals may be able to take advantage of it. Here's what happens. So you can see here, uh, I get just a tiny little a burst of pneumatic pressure early in the gate because uh, there's some noise in the ground reaction signal. Right? When you hit the ground, you're going to get a little bit of wobbling. So you'll see some forward and backwards noise. And at this, this patient has EMG on at that time, again, which is a common thing post-stroke. But it means nothing because the muscle just absorbs that small amount of impulse. So we got away with um, hardware in this case that has a little bit of dissipative uh, effect in it that works to our advantage. And then here in that second phase where you can see the black curve indicating propulsion um, and EMG happening at that time, we're getting a, a, a big control signal that's sustained, which generates a muscle force in the artificial muscle um, of about 150 newtons, which is pretty small for these muscles, by the way. Um, if you put them on the bench top and you hold them at their longest length and you turn them on, these will generate 800 to 1,000 newtons. So we're on the very low end of what the muscles are capable of, likely because they're in a posture where the muscle's at short lengths and it, there's a force length relationship that we have to deal with, just like real muscles. Um, so the other good piece of news here is that we're able to, this particular stroke survivor was able to use the exoskeleton's contribution to bump up the total, which is exactly what we want to happen. Again, just to orient you, uh, this peak of 80 for that gait speed is still not approaching what a healthy control subject would do. Um, so we're not getting total values where we'd like them quite yet. Um, so here's some summary data from all five subjects. What I'll be showing is in black is the no exoskeleton condition, so just normal walking. Um, red is wearing the exoskeleton but no artificial muscle activity, and blue will be the powered condition. So the exoskeleton is, is using the control algorithm to generate uh, forces through the pneumatic muscle. You can see that on the paretic ankle, so on the weaker side, um, these people are able to generate higher moments at push off, which is a good thing. 16% increase. And uh, they could generate higher peak power outputs, although you can see that the power output is a little bit coming a little bit earlier than maybe we would like. There was a 9% increase there. And then uh, we also measured metabolic cost. And again, this was a very acute study. We, it was one session where patients came in blind and they walked for three five minute bouts and that was it. So I'm, it, you could take that as uh, a point of excitement as well because they haven't trained a lot yet. And so the longer term studies still need to be done. You can see that there is an added mass penalty because they've got to walk around with some extra stuff on their body. Uh, but, it's, it, but over time, they're able to start dipping into that. They're able to start utilizing um, the mechanical assistance that they're getting from the exoskeleton. Where we want this to go is, you know, way down here. Because remember, this dark bar is 50% higher than what control subjects are doing. So we still have a lot of work to do. but it's promising that in that short period of time, subjects seem to be able to incorporate the assistance to, to get some improvement in gas mileage. OK, so that's part one of the talk. And I'll pause a little bit and maybe take some questions. But first, I just want to say a few things here. So we found that we could enhance moment um, at push off. There was no statistical increase in that peak power output, however. Even though there was a 9% increase in the time series data I showed you, when you do proper statistics across this small cohort, um, no significance yet. One point I want to make is that I think that the strategy we used was really hinged on doing basic studies first to try to understand how the mechanics and energetics of the gate are different in the first place, um, to create sort of a roadmap for assistance rather than just you know, blindly putting a piece of high-powered metal on a person, we should take a step back and try to understand a little bit about why they're good at walking in the first place or maybe not so good at walking in the first place. 
Um, and then it may be the case that using a focal approach where we concentrate on one joint versus a multi-joint system, it's a good place to at least start. Um, and I think we've been able to show that over a few years now of, of studies where we're making pretty good gains by just providing assistance at the ankle joint only. But there's still multiple problems, like you can't go outside the lab, right? So this time, no clinical populations, completely healthy participants from here on, and still a focus on gas mileage. But now the goal is to try to break the barrier, break the metabolic cost barrier in, in healthy folks, and do it. Um, I think we challenged ourselves to do it without, without motors. So we don't want to transfer any net energy to the person. We want to use strategic energy exchanges within the gate and harness those in, in, in ways that we can um, actually offload muscles without transferring any net energy to the person and have a, a metabolic benefit. So let me tell you how, a little bit more about how we thought about that. Um, so this is all about augmenting already healthy human performance. We're going to focus on the ankle. The last few years have been really exciting in this area because a number of groups, um, starting with Philip Malcolm um, in Europe, showed that you can provide mechanical assistance. In, in, in that case, it was a tethered device to go below that added mass cost and make real gains, uh, real improvements in gas mileage. And then uh, following Philip Malcolm, Hugh Herr's group at MIT developed this really cool um, uh, high, high power output, small motor in a, in a very sneaky configuration with a long moment arm and showed that you could do the same thing in a portable package now. So you can leave the lab with that thing and you get about a 7, seven to 10 percent reduction in metabolic cost. Below just war wearing your normal sneakers. Okay, so these are real gains. And, and both of those, by the way, were local focal approaches at the ankle. Um, I kind of like this chart as a, a, a stake and claim chart. So Hugh actually, Hugh Herr's group published this in their paper. They calculated this thing on the x-axis called the augmentation factor. I, I won't get into details, but it's basically high numbers mean I'm transferring a lot of net energy from the device to the person over a gate cycle. Um, and it also accounts for added mass. So the augmentation factor would be high if you had a light device that was transferring a lot of energy to the person. So that's this direction. Um, you can get negative values because there's devices out there designed to harvest energy. So the, the Donalin device is an example of this. Uh, you wear a frame at your knee and you're trying to power um, a headlamp or your cell phone by harvesting energy from the gate. So the device is stealing energy from the person. So that's negative values on augmentation factor. Metabolic improvement, positive values are good. That's if you're above zero, you're breaking the barrier, breaking the normal barrier. And if you're below zero, you're uh, in some cases really fancy exercise machines, which that's what Hugh says too. I'm not, I'm not railing on them. So they, they fit this line, which they say is, is a fundamental relationship, which is that if the augmentation factor is higher, then the metabolic improvement should be higher. And this all hinges on the idea that it's about transferring net energy from a device to a person. And so we, want, we contend that that's not necessary. Human walking is a net energy zero task if you're moving at steady speed on level ground. And so muscles are just wasteful when you're walking on level ground, right? Like, why do you need muscles? Why not just put all springs there? They do need to be there to replace some losses, but they certainly don't need, need to be there to be powering the gate. So let's try to take advantage of this fact and use strategic design to bypass some of the inefficiency of muscle. So we challenge ourselves. Let's try to reduce metabolic costs without any external energy source. And we did some basic science to get inspiration for this by using ultrasound imaging to have a look at how the calf muscles in Achilles tendon interact during walking and running. And, um, and we weren't the first, we certainly didn't pioneer ultrasound imaging. Other people had taken a look at excursions of muscle and compared them to how the whole joint is moving and found basically that the muscles act quite isometrically during steady gait at the ankle. So they're, they're coming on and they're 
acting kind of like a clutch. They're a mechanical strut that the tendon can then stretch against. And much of that stretch is transfer of the body's energy to um, potential energy in the material, right? So in the stretch of the tendon. And then, so you can turn your muscle on, grab the tendon, let the body rolling over a flat foot, store energy in the tendon stretch, and then get that energy back to propel the gait forward. And that means that the muscle didn't have to change length, which means the muscle can use less ATP because metabolic energy cost in muscle depends on its velocity. Okay, so these bars down here just show you um, if you do a mechanical analysis of how much of the energy coming out of the gait at push-off in the calf muscles is coming from in white tendon recoil versus in black fascicle shortening. There is still some fascicle shortening and they're not, they're not perfect clutches. You see that it's, it's about half. Um, so the gait is not being powered by shortening muscle. It, much of what's happening is elastic energy storage and return. So uh, this is a collaboration with Steve and actually I think some of these ideas probably started out when we were in graduate school together. We never really pursued them because of advisors who were making us do other things. <laughs> but but when, we, when we entered our own lab space, we decided to try to you know, start pursuing it a little bit. And what came out of it was Bruce Wiggin, um, pretty talented design guy, helped us develop a clutch spring mechanism that lives in parallel with uh, the human calf Achilles tendon. <coughs> And I'm not going to go into details. You can read about this mechanism on your own. But it's basically a ratchet pawl system. Uh, requires no power. No, there's no electromechanical stuff in here. It's just some timing pins that control the engagement and disengagement of a ratchet onto a pawl. And that's, that's, that's coupled to um, the normal gait kinematics during walking in such a way that when your foot hits the ground, uh, the ratchet pawl locks Allowing, allowing the body's energy to stretch the spring, and then later that energy comes back and the paw is released, the ratchet paw system is disengaged so that the person can freely move their foot during swing, which is, which is key. If you didn't do that, they would have to move against the resistance of the spring to reset their foot, which would make metabolic energy costs go way up. Uh, so here's a quick video. All this stuff you can Again, take a look at later, but this is just describing sort of the cycle that happens. We put these on people bilaterally. This is not power, it's a measurement. So we're measuring the forces in those springs so that we can calculate the torque contribution of the device. Um, so what happens is just before your foot hits the ground, your toe is naturally moving towards your shin to create a heel strike. And we have one of the timing pins set so that uh, that toe interaction towards the shin engages the ratchet system. So that now when your heel strikes, the device allows you to plantar flex or move your toe toward the ground without any resistance. So you come to a flat foot. Then the moment that that mov movement reverses to dorsiflexion, um, the ratchet is there and engaged. The ratchet pulse system is engaged. And now your body's momentum, your body's energy is transferred to the spring and then later, and we're just doing this one leg, then the other leg, right? Okay, so what's happening is that um, that spring is carrying some of the load that would otherwise have been inside the muscles, which are acting as wasteful clutches, basically, inside the person's body. We did a parameter study to dial in the appropriate stiffness of the spring. So if you just do a simple thought experiment, if that thing is too stiff, like think about it as a rigid thing. It immobilizes your joint. Not a good idea. If it's too compliant, you can't store any energy in it. Not a good idea. We hypothesize that there should be a sweet spot. And um, that's what we found. So here's some mechanics data just showing that as we increase the stiffness of that parallel spring, we could get higher and higher peak torques up to a point. And at that point is when the person starts modifying their kinematics. They don't want to move into a really stiff spring, so that it starts hindering their motion a little bit. Um, but we could get about 20% or so of the ankle joint um, impulse, rotational impulse, out of, out of the, uh, the, the stiffest springs. And then here's what the, the metabolic cost data looks like. 
So here is walking with normal shoes. We found no significant added mass cost for this device, which is, was a little bit surprising to us. But we actually found that some subjects we think were able to stabilize themselves in the frontal plane by using a device that restricts um, frontal plane movement. Um, and then an intermediate stiffness was best, and we could get a 7% reduction, which you might say, oh, 7%, big deal, right? It's pretty big deal. It's about it's a 10 pound backpack, is equivalent to 7%. So if you're carrying your laptop around all day and wearing these, you know you can cancel that effect and look really cool at the same time. <laughs> um, that also means that in endurance walking, right, you could extend your ability to go distance um, quite a bit. Okay. And I'm going to skip. This is just a little bit of basic science about why it works. I'll say a few things about this. Um, this approach, OK, so if you, if you measure the mechanical power output of the ankle joint, that's this curve down here. Negative is a storage phase. There's a long, slow storage phase, and then a high burst of mechanical power that comes out. If you use that as a roadmap for assistance, you build a device like I showed you in part one of the talk, which is a pneumatic muscle that shortens and transfers energy from the device to the person during this phase. The problem is that we know now from the ultrasound studies that that's not where the metabolic energy is being spent. The metabolic energy is being spent by the clutch to hold on to the spring, which is storing energy. And that happens much earlier in the gait cycle. So what we think is happening, we need to do a lot more follow-up studies to confirm these ideas, is that the devices that are targeting um, power output phases of, of the gait at the ankle are missing the boat. That's not where the metabolic energy is to be had. The metabolic energy is being sent, spent by muscles holding force early. So what we get out of the spring device is assistance that comes much earlier in the gait cycle. And we're supporting force you know, basically from 10% all the way through 60% of the gait cycle. And you could interpret that uh, as saying that it's the cost of muscle force production for these muscles that matters, not, not the cost of doing mechanical work. And so uh, that creates a little bit of a paradigm shift, um, at least for ankle joint assistance, because it changes the way we think about the timing and the approach for providing assistance. Okay, so if we come back here, um, we can stake a flag here, which, which lives off of that curve, which which we thought beforehand might be fundamental, that it's about net energy transfer. So this device is an example that, that shows that uh, you can, we actually absorb a little bit of energy, right? The springs in our device are not perfect. And by absorbing a tiny bit of energy, we can get a metabolic improvement. And so what that means is that this relationship doesn't seem to be fundamental. And who knows where else we can go in this space um, by adding assistance maybe at other joints, right? The, the goal is to go up, straight up from here, or up and left a little bit or something. Okay. All right, and then, yeah, so we're extending these studies now by using a cable-driven system to do really rapid parameter sweeps of springs. So we're emulating the feeling of a spring by using control through an end effector. And that, that allows us to actually start to think about what might happen during running, how does the stiffness optimal stiffness coupled with walking speed. Would it be possible actually to reduce metabolic cost with a spring while someone walks uphill? That sounds crazy. That's a net energy generating task. But if it's about cost of force, um, that's totally within the bounds of possibility. Right? Okay. There's a lot of take home messages here, but I'm not going to say them all. And I'm going to stop here and take more questions if you want to hang out. Gotta be more questions. Jin Sung Kim told me he had some kind of super cool liquid. So I'm out here to ask him, what makes that liquid so cool? When Professor Jin Sung Kim and his team first